Next on KQED Newsroom, where there's smoke, there's vapor. The debate over e-cigarettes heats up. When you inhale it, a little light goes on as if it's lit. Hydrogen cars get a boost in California, but are there enough stations to fuel them? I drive a very rare car. There's only a handful on lease here in Northern California. Plus, telling the stories of communities through sketches. Acclaimed artist Wendy McNaughton with her tales of the city. Good evening and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Smoking electronic cigarettes could soon be illegal in most public places in San Francisco. But I think it's really important to show I had a banana flavored one, here's a peach flavored one, but I know that other flavors from bubble gum, gummy bears, and other flavors are not targeted at um, elders, they're targeted at teens and youth. The Board of Supervisors voted unanimously this week to include e-cigarettes in the city's strict anti-smoking laws. A similar measure is being considered in Santa Clara County next week, and restrictions have already passed in Los Angeles, New York, and elsewhere. E-cigarettes are gaining popularity, especially among teens. They provide nicotine, but instead of producing smoke, they emit a vapor. Supporters say they offer smokers a less harmful alternative. Opponents contend e-cigarette makers are targeting young people through marketing. Joining me now for a discussion about e-cigarettes are Michael Mullins, founder and CEO of Digital Cigs, Rachel Grana, researcher at the Center for Tobacco Research and Education at UCSF, and Marisa Lagos, San Francisco Chronicle City Hall reporter. Marisa, uh, let's begin with you. How do these cigarettes work and why do San Francisco lawmakers feel a need to regulate them at this time? Um, yeah, so these are... Uh, little tubes, Michael will show you one later, um, that have a cartridge in them that actually includes nicotine and some other chemicals. When you inhale them, um, it is lit up, uh, or I'm sorry, heated up. Um, not as hot as, say, a combustible cigarette, but enough to emit this uh, vapor or aerosol, as, <laughs> as uh, researchers are calling them now. Um, and essentially, the Board of Supervisors said, we're seeing use of these explode um, among all sort of levels, and they wanted to basically protect people. Um, Eric Marr, the sponsor, says that even though they're not as bad as cigarettes, he still feels that they're polluting other people's space um, with dangerous chemicals. And they really, cities around the nation and counties have pointed to the FDA's lack of regulation of these as sort of a reason to step in. Although, arguably, you know, the city might be doing this regardless of what the FDA said because our smoking laws, you know, supersede any sort of national laws. So, so these e-cigs, our, our e-cigarettes, are, are essentially pretty new. They've been around for only about seven years. Um, Rachel, you and your colleagues at UCSF did a study on them, uh, on the marketing of these devices. What were your key findings? We found that the products, uh, we did an analysis of the online website marketing, and we found that the products are being marketed in ways that might appeal to kids. Um, they're being marketed with fruit, candy, and even alcohol flavors. And there's also marketing that features celebrities, including on television. And uh, television has been closed to tobacco cigarettes since about the 1970s. So people might be seeing something that looks like smoking advertised on television for the first time in their lives. And what's the impact of this marketing, do you think, among young people? I think it could be appealing to young people and what we do know is that data from the CDC show that e-cigarette use among youth has also risen rapidly. From 2011 to 2012 it doubled and uh, that's very concerning. And uh, I think the same CDC study uh, also found that one in five middle schoolers who tried e-cigarettes say they had never tried a cigarette before. Michael Mullins, you um, own three stores in San Rafael and Santa Rosa that sell these devices. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the various arguments and concerns about the products that you sell? 
Um, well, they've been they've the the same kind of arguments and concerns have been going on for quite some time now. Um, one of the, the ones that I hear over and over is the flavors. You know, um, flavored um, they 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 got rid of uh, flavored cigarettes, um, uh, so that you can't have that anymore. But one one thing that uh, people seem to forget is that um, I, I'm an adult. You know, I'm 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 in my 30s, late 30s. I like flavors too. And I like chocolate, and I like peach, and I like all those flavors too. And I don't think that because, um, you know, I believe that there's some regulation that needs to happen. I believe that there's some good manufacturing practices that need to start happening. And I believe that um, rolling these kind of products in with tobacco rules and regulations is not the answer. I think that there should be a classification itself for this product rather than just a tobacco product. Yeah, I mean, I think on the city level, it was sort of an issue of expediency, right? The city wants to treat these like tobacco products because it's easier, because they can say, mm -hmm. you know what, don't smoke these where you can't smoke cigarettes. And in San Francisco, quite frankly, it's easier to say where you're allowed to smoke than when you, where you aren't. Sure. Um, really, in your own home and curbside are the only places that that are really legal. You can't smoke in parks, you can't smoke at bus stops, you can't smoke in public buildings and businesses. Um, so I, I don't know that the Board of Soups really stuck their toe into the debate or is this a tobacco product. I do think that um, they definitely talked a lot about the issue of kid use and, and the fact that they sent some youths out right before the vote and said it was incredibly easy to buy these. Well, Rachel, is there any, any credible evidence that um, there are harmful toxins and chemicals in e-cigarettes? So because the product's unregulated, there's not a public accounting of exactly what's in the product. So users may be exposed to things that they're not, they're not aware that they're getting. Um, what we do know um, from, from research that's already been conducted to date on the e-cigarette liquid and the aerosol is that there are some toxins found in the vapor and there's also nicotine. Uh, excuse me, in the aerosol, and there's also nicotine. So people who are exposed to that may be exposed to those toxins and um, nicotine. In so samples, a lot of the in product the samples market, that you tried, that you sampled, that right? people, um, not myself, but other researchers have conducted okay. analyses of across brands. Yes, well, correct. Well, let me ask you this, Michael. I mean, it's obviously there are health concerns, there are concerns about yeah. marketing to um, to young people. Are there beneficial uses of e-cigarettes? I mean, are they? Um, do they? greatly reduce the risk of tobacco-related deaths among uh, smokers of regular cigarettes if they were to switch to this as, as an alternative? I'm pretty confident without any scientific evidence that if you were to put 20 people in a room and have them smoke cigarettes for 60 years and put 20 people in another room and have them use e-cigarettes for 20 years that those people would definitely be, their smoking cigarettes would probably pass away. <laughs> faster than, or have health concerns yeah. faster One than the other. So it's not a cure all. It's not a, I don't believe it's a, a smoking cessation device or a tool. It's, a, like I said, it's a lesser of two, oh, much lesser of two evils. Yeah, and I think even um, the folks at UCSF who, who she works with would say that you know Stan Glantz who runs the center told me you know these are one tenth as bad as cigarettes we think cigarettes are terrible so being one tenth as bad doesn't mean to make them good mm -hmm. um, personally I know people who have used them to help quit I know people who tried to use them to help quit and ended up just sort of using them in in scenarios where it was not acceptable to smoke a combustible cigarette mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of the manufacturers are concerned about these types of regulations is that they have been marketing them as a sort of way around anti-smoking laws, right? You can light up in an office, you can light up, you know, at a, at a club, wherever, um, you don't have to go outside. And so mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the reasons that in other places we've seen a lot of industry pushback. So well, that's one of the... Oh, I'll sorry. go ahead, please. That's one of the main concerns, is that um, also one of the conclusions of the analysis of the marketing that I found is that they're explicitly marketed to get around smoke-free laws and as a convenience or just like smoking but without the negative. So, um, where what is concerning is that in the long, uh, excuse me in the um, cross-sectional studies, which means when you look at who's using e-cigarettes, most e-cigarette use is among current smokers, and that represents what we call dual use. So they're using both e-cigarettes and cigarettes, and a concern would be that people might just use it in places where they can't smoke, keep smoking, and not quit, and not make quitting cigarettes a long-term uh, and a short-term goal, which 
really is what would save you from the death and disease associated with smoking tobacco cigarettes. The goal should really be to quit all tobacco cigarettes and that um, mm. dual use of both products is a concern. And what makes this so fascinating, of course, is that it's a big market, $2 billion in sales last year. And, and some analysts have said that it could even eventually exceed the $80 billion tobacco market. So certainly uh, something that a lot of lawmakers are watching. In fact, the uh, San Francisco Board of Supervisors holds its second vote next week and it is expected to be signed into law. All right, well, thank you all for joining us. Marisa Lagos, Michael Mullins, and Rachel Grana. Well, after more than a decade of puttering along, hydrogen-powered vehicles may soon be taking off in California. The cars use hydrogen, not gas, for fuel and emit only water vapor from the tailpipe. Governor Jerry Brown recently signed legislation to fund more hydrogen refueling stations. And manufacturers like Toyota are coming out with new hydrogen car models. Still, the vehicles have a lot of catching up to do with other alternative cars already on the road. Scott Schaefer narrates our story. Like most people, Bill Holloway commutes to work, driving 75 miles from his home in Alameda, California. But then again, most people don't make their commute in a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. I drive a very rare car. There's only a handful on lease here in Northern California. This rare car uses hydrogen instead of gasoline and emits only water vapor instead of harmful pollution. The economy in this Mercedes is great. I average 58 miles per kilogram of hydrogen, which is the same as 58 miles per gallon in gas. I picked a hydrogen car because I was able to drive one of the early experimental models, and I'm kind of a geek. Car makers have spent more than a decade and invested billions of dollars to develop the technology. Catherine Dunwoody, executive director of the California Fuel Cell Partnership, thinks that investment is about to pay off. Having been involved in this now for 15 years and seeing the evolution of the technology, you know, these guys are serious. They really see the fuel cell vehicle as the future of automotive technology. In 2014, Hyundai will release a new fuel cell SUV in California, followed by new models from Toyota and Honda in 2015. But even with the rollout of these new hydrogen cars, drivers may hit a roadblock when it's time to refuel. My biggest complaint about this fuel cell car, and fuel cell cars in general, is there's nowhere to fill them up. For now, there's just one place Holloway can go to refuel his car in Northern California, at this station in Emeryville, owned and operated by AC Transit. Twelve of its public buses run on hydrogen. At the hydrogen pump, filling up is remarkably similar to filling up at a regular gas station. It only takes four or five minutes to fill, the same as filling up a regular gasoline car, so I had to make no adjustments at all. On a per mile basis, hydrogen costs about as much as gasoline. And like gasoline, hydrogen is flammable. But it disperses quickly if it leaks because it is lighter than air. I never worried about the safety of the hydrogen. The hydrogen tanks are buried in the middle, in the safest place in the car. The tanks also store hydrogen at high pressure, a recent innovation that has doubled the driving range of fuel cell cars, says Tim Lippman, co-director of UC Berkeley's Transportation Sustainability Research Center. What's very different now than several years ago is that we're able to store a lot more hydrogen on board the vehicle because we've gone to higher storage pressures that are now giving us a driving range of 250 or even 300 miles. Most battery electric cars can only travel 80 or so miles before needing to be recharged for several hours. A fuel cell car also needs electricity to power its electric motor, but here the electricity is made on board from hydrogen inside a fuel cell stack. Here is a fuel cell stack that's very similar to the type that you'd see in a fuel cell powered car. Each cell has a special membrane material in the middle that splits the hydrogen molecules into protons and electrons. The protons are now charged particles called ions that can go through this membrane material, but the electrons cannot. So the electrons go around the membrane and generate electricity. Oxygen from the air also flows in and binds with the electrons and ions to produce water and heat, the only tailpipe emissions. But like electric cars, fuel cell cars still need a fuel source. Hydrogen fuel cell vehicles can be zero emission vehicles, but the only way you can do that is to use a renewable source for the hydrogen, and that could be solar power or wind power. Still, most hydrogen generated in the U.S. is made with methane, a natural gas. 
even though there's some CO2 produced from that process, it's still about 50% less than burning gasoline in a combustion engine. In October 2013, California, Oregon, New York, and five other states pledged to put more than 3 million zero-emission vehicles on their roads by 2025. With the nation's largest car market and its tough air quality standards, California is critical to the success of fuel cell cars and the infrastructure the cars require to take off. I can't go on a long trip. If they had more fueling stations, they would have more cars they could sell. If there were more cars, they would have more fueling stations. We have a chicken and egg problem. So in 2013, Governor Jerry Brown signed a new law that provides $20 million a year to build at least 100 hydrogen refueling stations in California by 2024. 19 new stations are already in development. The state funding helps offset the risk to these small and medium-sized businesses to make this investment to move forward with, with hydrogen fuel technology. But James Sweeney, a Stanford University expert on energy policy, questions the use of public dollars to help build hydrogen stations. The state wants to build hydrogen fueling infrastructure with no knowledge as to whether there's going to be a significant number of vehicles that will use those. It's a recipe for risking taxpayer funds for what may be a total waste of money. And this isn't the first time California has tried to promote a vision of a hydrogen Thank you. highway. Thank you very much. All across our highway system, hundreds of hydrogen fueling stations will be built. Arnold Schwarzenegger's plan relied on private investors to help build up to 100 hydrogen stations by 2010. But the plan failed. I think the original plan um, timing was ambitious, and I think that the cars really have come so far since the 2004 plan was established. Even so, will drivers choose hydrogen when electric cars and other clean vehicles are already on the road? It really drives just like any other car with a gas pedal and a brake. There's an emergency brake if you need it. Have fun. When Thanks. people get to test drive these cars, they'll be very impressed by the performance, how similar they are to conventional vehicles. While driving these cars may be easy, both fuel cell advocates and automakers know that their success depends on building more refueling stations soon. If San Francisco could talk, what would it say? That's the question at the heart of a new illustrated guide by artist Wendy McNaughton. It's called Meanwhile in San Francisco, the city in its own words. McNaughton has been sketching, observing, and informally interviewing Bay Area residents for years. She's also illustrated books such as the popular Lost Cat, a true story of love, desperation, and GPS technology. Scott Schaefer spoke with Wendy McNaughton earlier. Wendy McNaughton, welcome. Thank you. I think of this as kind of an illustrated love letter to San Francisco, your book, and you describe yourself as a graphic journalist. Uh, what do you mean by that and how does it relate to this book? I use uh, pictures that I draw and words of the people who I talk to to tell true, true, true stories about um, their lives. And so you're listening to people and talking with people and sort of taking composites of the things that you heard on the streets and throughout the city? Exactly, I spend anywhere from a day to a whole month with a group of people, writing down everything they say, getting to know them, um, and all the while drawing everything that I see, them, what they're doing, little snippets of things that we might otherwise overlook. One of the things you say in the book is that uh, San Francisco is a city of dividing lines, culture, uh, language, socioeconomic status, and so on. How did doing this book, how did you bridge those divides? Well, uh, the places that I looked at were communities that I didn't necessarily know very much about. So it was really interesting for me to go and talk to different people and find that in San Francisco, that there's so many different cities going on at once. I had an idea of my San Francisco, but this pointed out many others that are going on at the same time. Yeah. The, uh, despite the dividing lines, there are places in San Francisco where, everyone, where there's kind of crossroads, yeah. where everyone comes together for one reason or another. And you spend time in some of those. Civic Center uh, mm -hmm. is one of those. And the main library in particular. Tell us about that and why you chose the main library to, and, and, and the time you spent there and what you saw. I spent about a month in the main library and so many different people come through there. It is really a center of the city in so many different ways. 
And when I went in there, I thought it was going to be one story, but it turned out to be a very different one that revealed itself to me. It's the only place in the country at the time that had a full-time social worker, and they do so much good for the city. It's really incredible. And, and there's actually an illustration of the social worker in the book, Leah, I yep. think her name is. Yeah. yeah. What was she like? What, what does she do there? How does she spend her day? She works so hard. Um, she has developed a homeless outreach program, um, and so she actually reaches out to people who come and use the library for a place to be, a place to rest, to develop a job resume, and she'll help them get resources that support them, and she'll actually uh, sometimes help those people get jobs within the library doing outreach themselves. Yeah. As I said, it's a crossroads, the library, and you've got students, you, it's, it's kind of an after-school program for kids in yeah. some ways, unemployed folks looking for work, the homeless, of course. What are the kinds of things you overheard as you were there? You hear it all. I mean, first of all, it's a quiet place. You're not going to hear all that much. So I did talk to a lot of different people, and I heard people just talk about how much it meant to them, um, how all the different ways that they use it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there was also Charles, who you profiled, I think, a formerly homeless uh, person who, yeah. who also works there with the health department, I think. I mean, it's really a social service hub as much as a lending place, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, not far from there is... Uh, uh, 5th Street and Mission and 6th Street in Mission, which is, mm -hmm. as you say, a block away, but a universe mm -hmm. away. Describe those two blocks and how they're, how they're different. 5th Street, um, it, well, they're, they're both uh, pretty transient places. A lot of people moving through at all times, but in a very different way. 5th Street, you have people um, going to work, you know, to and from lunch, stuff like that, a parking garage right there. 6th Street it has uh, one of the largest concentration of SROs or sing single resident occupancy hotels. In a the lot city. of social services. A lot of social services going on there. And so you have two very different worlds just a block apart. And uh, one of the things you did is you illustrated the different things for sale on the two streets. Yeah, Quite different. very different. Very big difference between a really wonderful high-end coffee shop and um, a really, you know, great corner store, but they don't really sell anything to eat there. Yeah. You know, San Francisco is itself at a crossroads in a way. We have this civic conversation. Sometimes it's more of an argument going mm -hmm. on about the cost of living here and the techies coming in. And I would think that that part of San Francisco might be a place you could pick up on some of those tensions, some of those differences between people. Was that the case? Yeah, it's amazing. If you just stand on the street corner, which is one of the things that I did, and just listen to what people say as you walk by, the difference between the conversations on Fifth Street, which might be about getting to work and being very busy, are very different than what you hear on Sixth Street, which might be about, hey, how you doing? You're kind of hanging out on my front stoop. What's going on? You know? Yeah. Uh, you also profiled uh, Muni, spent mm -hmm. some time on a Muni bus, another yeah. one of those places where people congregate and interact or don't interact, but at least cross paths. Yeah. Um, and you profiled a, a driver and sort of one of the things you pointed out was the, the rituals that they have at the beginning of the day. Yeah, up at the crack of dawn and going through getting the bus ready, cleaning everything off, making sure it's in tip top condition. And then he gets on the bus and he's one of the people who has this incredible overview of San Francisco. He cuts through so many different places. First class seat. First class seat, he sees it all. And so if you get on Muni and you ride around on the different routes, you really do get to see a lot. You take note of the number of times people say hello and thank you. Uh, not very many. Not very many. <laughs> not it gives you an appreciation many. for how tough that job is. Yeah, and how very patient those people are. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you also uh, paid a visit to Golden Gate Park and what everyone thinks yeah. of is the buffalo, but it, as it turns are out, they're buffalo, bison. They're, they're bison. bison. Yeah. Yes. What, did you, what did you find out there? Um, well, Buttercup the Buttercup, bison. Buttercup, <laughs> they have amazing names. Everyone has a name and a different personality, and they've been there for a long time. and. Supposedly, they're quite happy. Yeah. I guess you could do this kind of thing anywhere. You could do it in Los Angeles. You could do it in Sacramento, San Diego, yeah. Chicago, New York. Do you feel that you've captured or do you, would you capture something different in those places? Or are urban centers, you know, do they, are they so similar in a way? I think that there are similarities in their diversity. I think that there's 100,000 different stories to tell in every city, and I would love to capture more. All right. The book is called Meanwhile in San Francisco, The City in Its Own Words. Wendy McNaughton, thanks for coming in. Thanks so much for having me. And to watch Wendy McNaughton at work in her studio, please visit our website at kqed.org arts.
And joining me now for a look at other news stories we're tracking is Scott Schaefer. Hi, Scott. Hi, Tui. Well, an update on something we reported last week. Uh, we talked to State Senator Ed Hernandez about his proposal, SCA 5. That would have repealed parts of Prop 209. Um, that's the measure that, uh, that's the law that bans affirmative action in public college admissions. Well, this week, a complete turnaround. Assembly Speaker John Perez pulled it. Why? Well, since it passed the Senate in uh, January with the supermajority, Democrats barely passing it, Asian American groups in particular have organized against this. They feel that things aren't broken, why fix them? 42% uh, of admissions to UC Berkeley are Asian American, and they were concerned that if anything changed uh, and that affirmative action were allowed to be used for admissions, that they would be the losers. And so three uh, Asian American senators uh, went to uh, Speaker Perez and said, please pull this off the docket. We don't want you to vote on this. We don't want this on the ballot this year. Now, the three senators, including Leland Yee of San Francisco, voted for it in January. Why the change of heart? Well, I wouldn't say these are profiles in courage. Uh, mm -hmm. They uh, see the politics are difficult for them. Uh, three of these folks are running for office. The speaker, John Perez, is running for controller. Leland Yee is running for secretary of state. And Ted Lieu uh, is running for Henry Waxman's congressional seat. I think the last thing they wanted was to be in the middle of a crossfire between, say, Hispanic groups and uh, Asian American groups. And so I think they just wanted it to go away. Uh, another ballot measure bit the dust this week as well. Um, this was by wealthy conservative Ron Unz to raise the state minimum wage uh, to uh, $12. What happened now? He's saying that it's unlikely to make it on the ballot. Yeah, well, you know, he was hoping to get money. He, he uh, You need about a million bucks to get these things on the ballot to collect signatures. And he came out this week and said, you know, I don't think I'm going to be able to get the money from organized labor, and I'm not going to be able to get money from any of these wealthy Republicans either. And so he said it's probably just not going to happen. There just wasn't the money there to do it. Uh, and Kamala Harris, our state attorney general, this week uh, issued a report on transnational crime, which found that California is the top target for uh, crime syndicates in China, Africa, and Eastern Europe, uh, with $30 billion in money laundered going through California each year. Um, why the target here in California? Well, this is a hub of innovation. There's a lot of wealthy people here. We have a $2 trillion a year economy, and so you see a lot of internet hacking, You've got drugs coming across the border through San Diego. Uh, you've got identity theft, all kinds of things. It's just a rich, a target rich environment, uh, as you might say, just because of who lives here, the kinds of businesses that are here, trade secrets and all those things. And so uh, the attorney general is actually going to Mexico next week with other attorneys general from other states to deal and talk with the Mexican authorities about these kinds of things. And of course, it's widely believed she'll run for governor in uh, four years. Burnishing her credentials, yeah. yes. All right, well, Scott, thank you. You bet. And for all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org. I'm Scott Schaefer. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Tui Vu. Have a good night.